cool with daddy. Oh, there you go. Hi, everyone. Bye, Bye baby. <laughs> So welcome to um, literally my kitchen table. I am Suzette Martinez Valadares, Republican candidate for U.S. Congress in California's 25th Congressional District. Um, Charlotte was just spending a little lap time with me, but she wanted to go hang out with Daddy. Super excited. This is my third uh, Facebook Town Live, live Facebook Town Hall. And it's really be starting to become a favorite part of my week, you know. Um, I get to spend my week meeting with, um, not with organizations, meeting with stakeholders, meeting with voters, really listening to everyone on a one-on-one -on -one basis, um, and literally traveling across this amazingly beautiful district in the Antelope Valley, Santa Clarita uh, Valley, San Fernando Valley. Um, Simi, I was in Simi Valley last night. I had an amazing week. Um, let me just tell you something about the Simi Valley Republican Club. I was there last night and they really have a robust um, Republican activist group who is ready to save California, to take back the 25th Congressional District. They're so excited that we have myself, a conservative modern Republican ready um, to take the helm and represent our district's values in Washington. So I've had a really great week. Um, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about some current events, right? So last night, um, or yesterday I should say, I called you know my sister-in-law and my dad all in the valley and I said, hey, it's election day for you. If you live in Los Angeles County within um, LAUSD, within the LAUSD school district boundaries, you have to get out to vote. Um, so last night, Measure EE -E, um, that was proposed failed. And um, it only won 45% of the vote. And I know we're still probably waiting for some results, but the measure didn't meet the two thirds threshold required to raise taxes in the state of California. And I was, very surprised and very excited. Actually, I didn't know that I was surprised because when I go to the gas pump, I'm feeling the taxes. When I go to the market, I'm feeling the taxes. Across at, with my small business, I'm feeling taxes. With the community members that I'm talking to, they're feeling the taxes and the regulation. There is not a huge appetite in California for voters to, be, to willingly accept any new taxes. So I wasn't too surprised. I guess it was a toss up, right? I was surprised and I wasn't surprised. It gave me some hope that taxpayers and voters are finally getting it. So Measure EE would have added a 16 um, cent per square foot parcel tax on properties um, within Los Angeles County, within LAUSD's um, school district boundaries. So for a home that was, you know, 2,000 square feet, you would have an additional $320 of taxes uh, a year. And let me tell you, you know, my mortgage taxes are impounded, um, and I would have felt that. I mean, it wouldn't have affected me personally, but as a homeowner and a property owner, um, where we're paying a fluctuating rate of gas on a monthly basis, um, we feel every dollar that California is taxing us. And interestingly enough, hi Joe, good to see you. Hi Major, good to see you too. Um, so uh, amazingly enough today, um, um, Assemblyman um, Vince, uh, Vince Fong over in the Kern County area um, posted something really interesting on Twitter, and that is that California has a $22 billion surplus. And really, that $22 billion that I, you know, just paid my taxes back in, in April, actually in March, um, should really come back to the voters. And if we have a surplus, we should really be cutting uh, rebate checks to taxpayers. And that's that's just my belief. We have a surplus. It should go back, uh, go back to, to the taxpayers. So 
I know that if anyone has any questions out there, I'd love to talk to you guys a little bit about education um, until we get maybe some, some additional questions. Education happens to be, I happen to be very passionate about education. Um, again, I have a niece who was diagnosed as severely developmentally delayed. She was nonverbal and on the autism spectrum. And luckily, my mom, who had worked for Los Angeles Unified School District in um, the special education department for years, for over for a few decades, um, saw the signs and was able to get my niece diagnosed at, at two and a half. And come to find out um, through you know, personal experience here, when children are diagnosed early, um, who, with children with developmental disorders who are diagnosed early actually receive early intervention services, you can literally change the quality of their life. The earlier you identify developmental disorders, the better off children are. So for that zero to five age group, it's just so important that they have access to early childhood education. And some people are like, well, early intervention, early childhood education, how do those two connect? Well, it's very well known that some of the first people to identify developmental disorders are early childhood education professionals. So your preschool teachers, your kindergarten teachers, when they have kids come into the classroom, I mean, you can ask them. They don't make diagnosis, but they've literally been doing, you know, teaching early learning year after year after year. They notice developmental delays. So it is so important that children have access to early childhood education to one, be help identify some of those developmental delays and get them early intervention services early. But really the other reason why we need to invest in early childhood education is because we're seeing kind of on the adult end of the workforce that what's becoming more and more important is emotional intelligence, is, is being able to work in groups. You know, some of these basic soft social skills that are taught at a very young age, we actually use throughout our life that help us live in, in, in a society where we depend on everyone. I mean, I'm a mom. Um, I, and you know, I have a husband and a wonderful partner, um, but to raise my daughter, Charlotte, it really <laughs> takes a tribe. So my mother was involved very much before she passed away last year. My dad was involved. Um, my, my mother-in-law is, is now watches, uh, my daughter, my, 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 uh, cousins, my, my friends, every, it's a tribe effort for all you moms that know out there. There's no way you, you could do this alone as much as we are super moms. We really can't do it alone. So early education, important, very important to me. So Joe, um, you have a question specifically, how will you deal with the issue of illegal immigration? Will you support cracking down on employers that hire illegal immigrants? So um, this is kind of like a two-part question because I don't think that you can address illegal immigration fully and completely until you've addressed uh, the reality that we need a safe, secure, and modern southern border. And my beagle agrees with me. He just said, yes, yes, yes. Um, we need a safe, secure, and modern border. Um, we need, you know, I think about the drug trafficking coming through the, the southern border, the human trafficking, the sex trafficking. Um, I think about the fact that coyotes are charging families um, from Latin America five, seven, ten thousand uh, dollars $10,000, and not necessarily even just families. They're charging individuals that much to, get, to bring them to the United States border um, because they know that our border system is broken. And now we're finding that they're using, using and cycling children into this mess. Um, it, it's disgusting when I think that there are children that are brought to the southern border and they know that if you come to the United States southern border and you have a child with you, they're going to let you in. Um, there's a 20 day holding period, but, and, and they may, you know, kick you back. They may kick you out into the United States and you may or may not show up to your hearing. But right now those coyotes are actually using those children. They're taking them back and assigning them to another client essentially and bringing them through the whole process again. There are over 16,000 um, known cases last year alone where children were abused. And this is a direct result of a broken immigration system, um, of a broken asylum system, 
and an underfunded border. So I believe that we need to fund our border fully and whether we need boots on the ground, whether we need barriers or a wall where it makes sense, where we need aerial technology, ultrasound technology, we have to fund our southern border for our own national security purposes to get rid of human trafficking and drug trafficking. Um, and that's the first part of immigration reform. We also do have to look at true immigration reform um, when it comes to the visas. And I think we do need an annual or maybe even biannual assessment of the visas that we are issuing. And that's because our economy changes, right? It's never the same. You guys watch the stock, mar stock, stock market. Um, our workforce needs change. Sometimes we need a workforce that is highly skilled and educated and very specific, but sometimes we need workers who want to come in and help, for instance, in California, um, agricultural workers. Um, and that needs to be assessed on an annual or, or biannual uh, basis. It's not something that is, is going to be a solid one thing fits all all the time. Um, I completely support immigration reform, a safe, secure, and modern border. Um, Joe, you had a beagle too. Oh, my beagle's name is Baxter and he is, how old is he? He's 12. So it's, it's funny because he was a little, like ex, a little tiny, excited puppy 12 years ago. He was all brown and spotted and now he's gray. He's very round and very slow. I love beagles. Um, they're the cutest puppies too. Um, Kelly. Can you discuss your viewpoint on the modern day woman's movement and its role uh, in the Republican Party? Um, you're right. I mean, I think there's a huge difference in today's modern women's movement. Um, and it's a different movement than we had literally 100 years ago when the suffrage, suffrage movement um, finally paid off and women were given uh, the right to vote. It was literally a hundred years ago. A lot has changed. Um, I think what you're talking about is two things. I think you're talking about the Me Too movement, um, which has been very profound over the past, you know, year and a half. And you're also talking about the amount of women who have been elected to Congress in 2018. So the Me Too movement. Um, the Me Too movement, I think, has been a very important step for women. And during that movement, movement, and I think a lot of it kind of also stemmed, you know, with um, with some of our Hollywood exec executives. But a lot of that also came um, came through during last year's Kavanaugh um, hearings um, for his um, nomination to the U.S. Supreme Court. And I have lots of heated conversations with friends. And what I actually came to find out is the Me Too movement. Is, is very, the Me Too movement and specifically women having had that experience is a lot more common than I ever imagined. And I had lots of personal conversations with friends who had been um, affected in some way or one way in another or another. And I think that movement really gave women the opportunity to say, hey, this happened to me. We're no longer gonna be the, the victims. We're no longer gonna ask for permission. We're gonna take, we're gonna take what's ours and we're gonna fight for what's ours. Um, and for me personally, I, I've just kind of lived my life that way. I am a conservative Republican. I believe in you know freedom and liberty. I live um, in a country that gives has given me equal opportunity and I've never needed permission to do anything. And I think it's been really nice to see um, that empowerment really reflecting throughout the United States. And I also love that last year we did elect more women to Congress than we ever have. And I think it's a vi all women, no matter your political party, should be very happy and proud and proud that, that that has happened. We need to see more conservative women elected to Congress. More Republican women need to serve in Congress right now. There was one woman, one woman, Carol Miller, who I actually spoke to um, a couple of months ago, about a month or two ago. She was the only newly Republican woman elected to Congress last cycle. And that is going to change. There is a huge appetite by other Republican women, such as Elise Stefanik, 
um, Congresswoman Carol Miller, um, who are all super excited to support women. You have UPAC, Winning for Women. There is a huge appetite to support women this this cycle, and I and I really think just just moving forward, we have a fresh perspective. Our conservative ideals are the same, but our perspective is different, which is needed in Congress. We need diversity of thought in Congress, not just you know a diversity of color, but we need fresh perspectives. We need citizen legislators. We need people who are gonna go to Congress that have real life experience, that live in our communities, that aren't you know the swamp. And I'm so excited for this movement. I'm excited to be a part of this movement, and I'm excited that I'm gonna be uh, a newly elected Republican woman in 2020 uh, to U.S. Congress. Uh, that was a long-winded, I think I have some, some more questions in here. Um, Jan Hearman, oh, Jan, thank you for joining. Um, Jan um, worked with my mother in the special education um, fields, oh my gosh, probably 20, 30 years ago, because I've, I've known Jan my, it feels like my entire life. And um, Jan, your question is, can you tell us your views on gun control? I support the Second Amendment, and I support the Second Amendment for lots of reasons, but overall, I support public safety, I support law enforcement. I We are a nation of laws, and those laws uh, should be followed. We are a nation governed by a United States Constitution, and the Second Amendment clearly states that we have the right um, to bear arms. I, in, in my household, we happen to own firearms. Um, I actually took some really cool pictures that I'm gonna be sharing with you guys soon. Um, but I support, um, I, I, I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, a couple of uh, years, oh, not even a couple of years ago, I'm getting old, guys. Uh, oh man, it must have been about 15 years ago. I was a bartender at Houston's in Pasadena, and one night a man walked into the bar, um, and that first night actually wasn't there. He scoped out the place, um, and there had been a string of robberies down a Royal Parkway, which is the street that Houston's is on. And um, he came in and scoped. Um, scope out the place one night and then he came back the next night where I was working on I was I was working that night and it was the end of the night and he came in and he was wearing a black hoodie and he had a gun in his hand and he was walking towards me because he knew where the cash was and he, he had to walk towards me past me in order um, to get to the safe and, and, and to the money and I froze for a second and I don't think I've ever been so afraid in my life to have a gun a gunman walking at you um, was a very scary thing and I froze and then I turn around and I ran and I think I think they saw on some security footage that I jumped like this eight foot wall or something back when I was really in shape um, but I went home that night and my um, roommate at the time was an armed guard and I told him about what had happened and I told him I was so angry because I didn't want to fear guns. I, I, I'm just, I, I don't like to fear things. I like to conquer things. So that night he showed me how to unload a handgun, how to load it, um, how to clear a chamber. Uh, and that's really where I decided to empower myself, to educate myself um, on guns. And we now live in Acton on 11 acres. And um, there's literally been times where I've walked out my front door and there's been a coyote, rather large coyotes. We have large rabbits and large coyotes and mountain lions and you name it. Uh, well, a coyote has been like five feet from me and I'm here thinking, where are my dogs? You know, I have a tiny little beagle and an English bull terrier. Um, and those are my first concerns. And now even more so that I have a small child, I'm concerned for several reasons. I'm concerned that I need to protect her. I'm concerned that, you know, we live in a very rural part of the district and law enforcement, our wonderful sheriff's department um, is 20 minutes out. Um, and if I need to defend my house, I should have every right to have um, the guns to do so. And I will defend, protect, and fight for everyone's right to bear arms. Great question. Um, next question. Hi, Candice. Uh, my cousin Candice is on. Um, Candice is amazing. She's a, a military wife over in Louisiana. Thank you and your husband sir, for serving our wonderful country. I love you guys. 
Andrea, Andrea, hey, how are you? Um, you have a question for me. Why are, Suzette, uh, why are you running for Congress? What inspired you to run for public office? Okay, that is a very open-ended question because I could talk to you guys for you know, 20, 30 minutes about um, why I'm running for Congress. Um, when I decided that I was going to actually you know, throw my name in the hat to run for Congress, um, it was a very uh, serious decision. I have I ran um, for state assembly before. I've worked on campaigns across California, in Louisiana, um, in Nevada. Um, it is a rigorous life for a campaign worker, yet alone a candidate. So having been through the process previously as a candidate, I knew how much of a sacrifice it is um, not only to yourself, but to your family. And last, um, last November, when Steve Knight, our wonderful congressman, lost his seat, I was just really super eager and excited to support um, whether it was him who was going to run again or somebody else. We, we for the first time, have had um, somebody who doesn't represent our values be elected um, to service in Washington, and that just did not sit well for me. And as I learned that Steve Knight wasn't going to run again, and I'd have conversations with my husband just about, you know, the growing acceptance of socialism from individuals like, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Did I say that Latin enough for you guys? <laughs> um, I had some serious conversations with him, and he said, you know, you need to run. So I, it wasn't that simple. I, you know, thought about my daughter. I, my daughter, who um, Charlotte is now two, I thought about when you have children, I, I have actually 21 nieces and nephews. Um, so I thought I knew a thing about loving children, having that many nieces and nephews, and I do love them to death. Um, but when you actually have children, um, your life changes and your priorities change. And the future means more to you than you could have ever imagined. And wanting to ensure that she grows up with more opportunities than I had and wanting to ensure that she grows up in a safe America, that she gets a quality education, wanting to ensure that she has every opportunity and that government stays out of her life and their role in her life should be limited were serious concerns for me. That as well as just being inspired by my mother who I lost last year to pancreatic cancer um, it was a really ugly battle and it was something I was not expecting at, you know, to deal with my mom's end of life journey when I was 37 years old. Um, I don't think, I don't think you're ready for that at any age. Um, but I, I just thought, you know, I'd have my mom and my parents with me forever until they were little old viejitos with canes. Um, and I just, you know, after losing my mom and, you know, trying to figure out what was next, um, running her nonprofit, um, I just remembered how much she inspired me over the years to fight for others, to, you know, put your money where your mouth is, to actually do something. She taught me to be a fighter and she was my, my biggest champion and really, you know, especially after I had Charlotte, she was my best friend. So I'm running because I want an amazing America to continue for my daughter and because I've been inspired by my mom um, and for this journey in my life. And I know she's up there and she's supporting me uh, even to this day. Um, that's a long roundabout way of answering why I'm running for Congress. Um, next question, Giselle. What is your opinion about Puerto Rico as a Republican? Did you support a change in the political status, statehood, independence, or commonwealth? That is a great question. Um, I actually am Puerto Rican, um, or part Puerto Rican. My mom's father um, was born in Puerto Rico. He was born in um, what they call the mountain people area of Calle. I've been to Puerto Rico several times. I have a lot of family there. It's funny because growing up on my dad's side of the family who is Mexican, uh, my mom's mother was Mexican as well, but um, the kind of true Latin culture that I was 
continuously exposed to was sal salsa music and pastelas and habichuelas and um, all these traditional Puerto Rican culture and food. Um, and I didn't know when I was young, I thought that was Mexican, come to find out it's Puerto Rican. And I love the island, I have lots of family there. Um, honestly, I think that that decision is up to Puerto Rico. Um, I know that it's you know closer than ever. Um, my understanding is that the population may want to apply for statehood, um, and I would just support their their will. I mean, I definitely think that there is a benefit for them. I think it's unfortunate that in order for them, and I understand why though. I'm a, I'm a constitutional conservative, so I you know agree with our constitution and would not change it. They need to go through a process to become a state. Um, but I, I, I think it's sad and unfortunate that they do have to move to the states in order to vote, to vote for president. Um, and it's something that I would support um, whatever they decided. Um, Mark, hi Mark. Um, and Kathleen, Kathleen, my, my friend from Houston. It's so good to see you on here. Um, Mark, your question is, I keep hearing you say you are a modern Republican. What does that mean exactly? Um, you know, it's funny because recently, I think the president is using the term modern, and I think he stole it from me because, you know, I've been saying that I'm a modern Republican for probably about a year now. And the reason why I say modern is because people like to label me as a moderate. And I... I don't think I'm a moderate. I consider myself a conservative Republican. I just happen to care a lot about modern issues. Um, and I've happened to champion some of those issues, whether it's you know issues like early learning and education, healthcare. Um, these are issues that for a long time, it seems like Republicans haven't championed or have stayed away from because they're seen as um, liberal, um, liberal um, issues and, and they're not They're, I mean, they affect everyone. Healthcare reflects, reflects everyone. If you have, you know, autism or if you have cancer or dementia, or if you have one of the 5,000 plus chronic illnesses or diseases, or if you're a woman, or if you're a man, um, that isn't decided based on your political party, right? <laughs> That's decided on, on, on your biology and your genetics. And I am just a person who believes that we can tackle those modern issues and that really that for every modern issue that we have, there is a conservative, um, free market, limited government solution. And that's not to say that I don't believe that government is responsible for certain things because they are and, and, and we are. Um, but the less government, the less regulation, the less oversight, um, in any of those issues, when we think about education or we think about healthcare, my conservative solutions say competition will fix those things. Um, and we need to legislate that way to make sure that we have um, a robust healthcare system and a robust quality education system. Um, great question. Um, you guys can steal that modern Republican term from me if you'd like. Hashtag modern Republican. Uh, interesting enough. Glenn, Glenn, my friend, it's good to see you. Thank you, Kelly, for your question. Haha, -ha. Clifford, I am looking forward to help drain the swamp, not only in Washington, but in California. I am a um, Republican who knows that we, um, we have conservative solutions to our modern day issues, and we um, are going to implement those in California too because this one party system, well, I mean, how's that working out for you guys? It's not. We have, you know, the, the highest poverty rate in the nation. Um, the middle class is leaving California. And I don't want to see Washington um, go in the direction of California. Johnny, I think I have time. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it's already going to be 830. Um, I have time for, uh, we'll just see how, how many questions we have there. Um, what do you say when um, Johnny, my actually my my other my cousin Johnny Martinez? Um, what do you say when people say that the Constitution is outdated? 
Uh, I say they're ridiculous. <laughs> no. The Constitution, you know what's so amazing about our Constitution is that we are a very young nation in terms of um, the world. Globally, we're a young nation, but we have one of the oldest constitutions in the world because it is the best constitution in the world. And what is so amazing about our constitution is that if we want to change something in the constitution, there is a process, but it shouldn't be easy because when we start to change things, um, there's, a, there's something called a slippery slope. And that slippery slope can um, take away our freedoms and our liberties. So there is a process for change, but that change has to be a change called from society. And there's a process that states have to be involved. The legislature has to be involved. And we have a true system of checks and, bal and balances what give is, and what it gives us the most freedom um, of any country um, in all of the globe. So I would say that our constitution is working. It's not outdated. Um, Denny, how can a Hispanic like myself get involved in politics? Well, this will be my last question. Um, I, I'm just going to tell you kind of how I got involved in politics. Um, well, first of all, I am a Republican because of Al Gore. I saw him speak at Fairfax High when I was, um, in high school, 18 years old, I think. Um, and everything he was saying directly contradicted the values that my parents taught me. So I um, actually started researching. I'm like, wait a minute, I, I'm, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not what Al Gore is. So wait, I'm a Republican. I actually think I listened for, to Rush Limbaugh for a little while during the 90s, thanks to my, my, uncle, my uncle John and my uncle Jess, actually. Um, so I decided to register as a Republican and you know, went to college, got a job, um, you know, moved out. Um, worked really hard to, you know, pay for my community college at College of the Canyons. And then um, in 2008, when the stock market, when the housing market crashed, I knew that if I wanted to influence um, conservative policies, which I knew were good for America and good for California, that I had to get involved. So I actually just called the Santa Clarita Republican headquarters and asked them if I could volunteer. So it was really as simple as that. And if you start volunteering, you learn more about the political process and how you can be a part of the process. And it's a little, little breezy here. Um, but if you really want to get involved, you can reach out to me. You can reach out to my team. I'd love to have your support. Um, if you live here in the district or even if you don't, we need a huge grassroots team to help take back California's 25th congressional district. Uh, we're going to need people to knock on doors, to make phone calls, to donate to guys. We need to raise a lot of money. This race, you know, um, is probably going to cost between five and seven million dollars. And I can't do this alone. I need your support. Um, if you'd like to donate, um, please visit my website at www.suzettevalderis.com, $5, $10. Um, if you won the lottery recently, you can donate $2,800. Um, um, I, anything and everything is helpful. And if you just want to volunteer and make calls, we're looking for volunteer leadership. Um, Michelle, if you're on Facebook now, if you could say hi to everybody, you can reach out to Michelle or direct message me and we would gladly um, help, uh, bring you into the fold and help you get involved in politics. So everyone, thank you so much for joining me for my third town hall. I'll be doing these every Wednesday at 8 p.m. I went a little longer tonight because um, my boss, Charlotte, isn't calling me yet. Uh, but I'll be doing this every Wednesday night from now and even when I'm representing you in Washington. It's a great opportunity for us to connect face-to-face, -to, -face, to learn about what's important to you, to talk about my week and some important current events and issues. So uh, see you next week, 8 o'clock. Bye, guys.